It's the warmer months here in the Southern Hemisphere, which means that it's time to photograph migratory shorebirds. I've been capturing their arrivals for the last couple of months now, and all of them turn up looking exhausted and gaunt with tattered wings. These aren't seabirds, so they can't swim or take a break in the ocean. They fly non-stop their entire trip, and if they become too exhausted, or if they don't have enough fat on them, they will fall into the ocean and drown. Everything they do depends on them completing these migrations. They also know where the best food is found, and return to the same feeding grounds every year. So a successful trip means that they must become, in a sense, obese. During this time they'll go through a plumage molt, and eventually grow stronger, more migratory friendly feathers. It is an onslaught of crab eating and resting, with the aim to return to their breeding grounds in the northern hemisphere over 7,000 kilometres away. It might look like the perfect lifestyle, getting fat and sleeping, but these migratory shorebirds are Australia's most endangered group of birds. Without a suitable place to recharge, rest and refuel, well, it's not good. There's many different types of shorebirds that visit the coast and feed along the mudflats during this time, such as the bar-tailed godwit, which has been recorded flying more than 11,000 kilometres non-stop from Alaska to New Zealand. This was done in little more than a week. There's also the wimbrel. Now, these guys are quite the chatty cathies of shorebirds. They're always squawking and the first to take flight when startled. They too are known to fly great distances, with one being recorded flying 80,000 kilometres over the span of about three years. But my favourite, and the largest migratory shorebird, is the eastern curlew. These birds are sometimes called the moon bird, since during their 20 year lifespan, they can fly the distance to the moon and back. They're also critically endangered, having lost over 80% of its population in the past 30 years. There are estimated around 25,000 eastern curlews left, which, considering their dangerous migrations, is not a lot. So, like many, shorebirds they're very skittish and e easy to take flight doesn't take much to set them off and this makes it hard to sneak up on them especially on places like mud flat because there's no trees or rocks you can really hide behind i remember one day i was down here beautiful conditions beautiful light no wind i had a pond and there was about 10 curlews surrounding it so i had that nicely lined up but then they all flew away they got all skittish because a flock of cormorants flew past so this is the nature of shorebirds on mudflats. You know, their, their eyesight is fantastic and it, uh, it's a real challenge. So what I do to get around that is I've worked out their feeding, uh, their feeding times, their resting times around the tide times. So what I do, I usually come in two and a half hours before a high tide and what usually happens is there'll be one curlew stationary there. And so I usually get my uh, 50 meter uh, distance from them not to scare them. What happens then as the tide slowly comes in is that more curlews and wimbrels and godwits and other shorebirds, they find this one curlew and they zero in on it and then that's the hangout for that afternoon before the tide comes in. So they do this all the time, consistently. This is the behavior that I've seen over time with all the times I've been down here. One gets there first, he's the ringleader and then they all just rock up and surround him. So two and a half hours is usually when the tide comes in so much that I have to move. And this is when I can get closest to them where they're not too skittish at the same time, which is, I probably have a window of about 15 minutes of good close curlew time. As the water comes in, they tolerate it for a bit and then they fly off. Uh, and usually I can get some great shots of them flying off, going to wherever they go at high tide. Now, I don't know where the curlews go at high tide, I know where the godwits and the wimbrels go, but the only way I can get to that place is with boat or with a kayak, because it's about a kilometre offshore. So, and luckily, I have a kayak. So the place I'm going to is a little bit uh, secluded, but also not. It's right next to a rather large channel where passenger ferries and car ferries go backwards and forwards the coast to the islands on the east coast. Now I actually have to cross this channel so hopefully I don't get t-boned by a passenger ferry. I, uh, 
don't really want to get mulched by a propeller today. Now, this is Kassam Island. I don't know what the requirements are to be considered an island, but this is more of a sandbank with mangroves growing all out of it. It is a hotspot for shorebirds to roost in high tide, so there will be shorebirds. I'm just not sure which shorebirds will be there. Kassam Island may be small, but plays such an important role in the environment along the coast. This sandbank and mangrove combo protects the shoreline from erosion during any storms or king tides. Not only do birds find it a safe space to hang out, but other animals do too, such as fish and juvenile sharks that feed all in between the safety of the mangrove roots. It's a bit hard to sneak up. A bit hard to sneak up on these birds with a fluoro white kayak. So luckily I have a extremely long telephoto lens. Clocks in about 800 meters, 800 millimeters rather. So that'll give me enough distance between my white boat and some shorebirds. So there's a dead mangrove tree that I can see through the gap there. And I'll try and, uh, try and come around. They're gonna scatter when I get there. That's just the nature of these birds, but I'll try and just use the tide to push me out. The tide is going in, but the waves from the ferries are pushing me along pretty well. Oops, I didn't bump that. All right, here we go. There we go. Oh, look at them all. This, look at this guy, he's a bit hot with his open mouth. It's understandable. What an entrance. Jeez, there's birds everywhere. You know, I had an idea that there's birds here. But not the amount and the type of birds. So, you might not have guessed it, but this pristine location, this marine park, uh, this area that is a Ramsar protected area, which is a, a, a treaty that protects wetlands and water areas around the world. There is a proposed development to uh, rip up all these mangroves, develop the coast 100 metres away, and concrete it all putting down 3,600 luxury apartments. Now, I've been here for half an hour and I've seen over 500 birds. Now, call me, call me old fashioned, but these environmental areas should probably be protected because they're full of endangered, critically endangered birds. Uh, not only that, it's an important area for you know, dugongs, dolphins, sea turtles, fish, uh, even the coastline, because ripping up all these mangroves will just annihilate the coast on any storms or high tides. And it's just baffling that 
the proposed development hasn't been cancelled yet. It's been pushed through to government and they're umming and ahhing about it at the moment, which is baffling, absolutely baffling. So the thing with this, if, it, if it's gone, if this is gone, the entire coast will be affected. The islands on the east coast will be affected. North, south, the sand will change, the channels will change, uh, you know, the livelihood of some people that fish off here. There's ecotourism around Stradbroke Island. So everything will be affected just so that someone can sit in a luxury apartment and pay for an overpriced trendy latte, you know. But I guess that is progress, isn't it? You know, you can't have your trendy lattes without grinding a few bones of endangered shorebirds, but, uh, you know. At the time of editing this video, this development is still in the air. It's a 50-50 chance of happening, which is just disgraceful. To be honest, I don't really like thinking about it because it makes me quite glum. Imagine traveling weeks on end to discover that your home has been completely destroyed and altered beyond recognition. This is what will be waiting for these birds if this development goes ahead. I find that photographing migratory shorebirds is such a rush. To see these magnificent animals when they arrive all haggard and exhausted, to when they leave all fat and looking brand new, has been a way for me to appreciate and connect to this location a lot more. The distances they travel without stopping is just mind-boggling. They're ultra-marathon athletes, but with feathers. These migrations require so much focus, stamina, and a bit of luck. Watching them arrive makes me think to times when their numbers were more plentiful. Times when the people along the coastlines would be watching and living with these birds for thousands of years, merging their arrivals and departures into their folklore and stories. So to lose these birds, like the Eastern Curlew, means losing another part of our history. These birds were our connections to the seasons, to the weather and to the sea. These incredible annual journeys are breathtaking feats of strength that have happened for thousands of years just quietly and without fuss right at our front door. So if we are the cause of their extinction, which by the looks is probably on the cards, all that will be left of these birds will be photos.